Welcome everyone to our conversation between art and heritage. And today we are going to focus basically on interactive um, musical themes. And our first presenter is Hyun Kim from South Korea and the UK. She just completed her PhD in ethnomusicology from the University of London. And she's now also a teacher at that university. But also, more importantly, she's a taikum player, a big flute. And basically she studies how music can be um, very interactive using traditional South Korean music paired with uh, jazz. And our other presenter today is Deborah Withers from the UK. She's an independent researcher who is also a trustee of the Feminist Archive South in the UK. And currently she's writing a book called Accessing the Already There, which focuses on feminine generations and transmissions along with digital culture. And her, her theme today, we'll be talking about music making in feminist generations. So today, we're going to start off with Tyler and Kim with her presentation. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Um, yeah, today I'm going to talk about interactive music making between Korean traditional music and jazz. As a musician who plays traditional music, I realized that the use of jazz in traditional music could be used for a way to in increase relevance and the mainstream appeal of traditional music in contemporary world. Accepting jazz as an ag <coughs> agent of globalization in the late 20th century, I began a project with jazz musicians to explore aesthetic connections between Korean music and jazz. Before talking about the collaborations, I will give you a brief introduction of my flute, the Taegum. During the Shilla Kingdom, one of the Korean kingdoms in the back in like a 660 AD, the flute gained its current title, Taegum, which denotes a big head flute print. So basically, it means a big flute. <laughs> so the Samgoksagi, history of the three kingdoms, written in uh, 1145, is the most significant indigenous source of this time. The legend of the sacred Taegum was documented in this book. Um, the top of the islands were into two in the morning and joined as one in the night. On, that, on the next day, the world shook, it rained as the wind blew, and the world was thrown into darkness for a week. When the king himself went to the island, a dragon appeared and told him that if the bamboo on the top of the island was cut down, made into flute and loon, blown, the country will be peaceful. If the king cut down the tree, the flute made from the bamboo was called So flute to come 10,000 ways. So the origin myth of this flute is Mamukashita, flute to come 10,000 ways. So I've told you very briefly about the history of the Tegum. The next thing to do, I'll just uh, briefly introdu introduce my Tegum. There's a, basically two kinds of Tegum, long one and short one. This one is for court music, so usually played in the royal like uh, palaces. So it's quite stable and meditative, and it's got big embouchure, which creates various kinds of articulation or tone qualities. <clears throat> and uh, and six big holes and uh, one of the characteristic of this flute is that uh, it has oval shaped hole called the mandolin. So if I just uh, um, play normally, uh, make just kind of a wooden flute sounds and normal sounds, but if I overblow it, it buzzes. It makes some kind of buzzing sound. Mm -hmm. And uh, <clears throat> as you can see, there's another one which is a shorter than the big one, court flute. This is for folk music, so I, this is a kind of a, has shorter body which creates a brighter tone color, so it's more suitable for like an outdoor activity, which is uh, appreciated by some public people. So, okay, I'll just uh, give you just a little <laughs> example of the sounds. As I told you, this is a, um, kind of a, used in the royal among the royal families, so it's more like stable, more quieter.
for you. And you, you require a different kind of technique, more vibrant. Jazz elements 
but also ones with um, any characteristics representing their origin in the West. American popular song, French chanson, Italian can canzone, leader, semi-classics, tango, rumba are all included. And the term jazz came to be considered as an equivalent to the later term pop. Namu Abitabu, written by Hye Kim in 1939, who is regarded as one of the most famous jazz song composers at the time, is an example. Uh, its style resembles early jazz, but the lyrics used in this piece are uh, drawn from Korean Buddhist chant. These old lyrics are from Korean Buddhist chants. The second stage of Korean jazz opened when the dominance of Korean culture shifted from Japan to the US. Within a few years of liberation from Japan at the end of the Pacific War, the radio station American Forces Korean Network, AFKN, began to function as a medium bringing American culture to Korea. Its contents became a symbol identified with local people's disposition to cutting-edge elitist cultures. Korean musicians were employed under personal contracts with individual American uh, clubs, but only when substitutes to jazz musicians uh, from America were needed. Actually, bringing Americans to, per to perform in Korea were, after all, quite expensive. Accordingly, from 1957, professional management companies named Yongyok Bul Suibokche started to handle the contract with Korean musicians, who, given the poverty surrounding them in the Korean society, as the culture country began its long recovery from the civil war, were eager to work in the shows. <clears throat> So the culture, Western culture, which emanated from the army camps, or was called GI Yunha, which is U.S. Army culture. But in the wake of the perception by some musicians that this jazz had little originality, attempts to return to more original spirit of jazz and to identify Korean jazz began to be made in the 1970s and 80s in Korea. These attempts gained a foothold with cultural platforms such as uh, the Space Theater, Gongang Sarang, and with the development of local recording companies such as what was later known as Sound Space. Uh, Sound Space. Uh, so from now on, I'm going to explore interactive music making of Korean jazz and Korean traditional music between the late 1970s and today through three three uh, different perspectives. Korean jazz musician living in Korea, Korean musicians who are trained and educated in traditional music, and transnational musicians living and uh, working outside of Korea. Including me. <laughs> with the Korean jazz musicians first. One of the representative groups leading the trend on the jazz side, representing the first perspective during the 1980s is Kang Trio. Consisting of Kwan Kang, saxophone, Kwan King, drum, and Son Bae Che, trumpet, formed in 1978, the trio often gathered at the Space Theater and collaborated with diverse musicians, including the the original members of the percussion quartet, Tamuluri. Tamuluri is a Korean traditional percussion quartet. I will just introduce it properly later. So this is space theater is um, quite important to places in terms of the development of Korean music. Uh, the space theater is one of the most significant, significant platforms for experimentation in performance. It is built by a prominent architect and cultural activist, Sukun Kim. It provided a variety of artists with a chance to meet and create experiment outcomes, yielding flourishing encounters between artists. 
in a variety of uh, concerts cutting across genres from free jazz to, to pan music festivals that mix the contemporary music and traditional music. In fact, the Samuluri, the Korean percussion band, gave their first performance ever in 1978 in this venue, just as the country was born. So let's uh, return to the country. This is Samuluri. Let's go back to the country. Uh, country leader Kang Tae Hwan was born in Incheon in 1944. His first instrument was a clarinet, studied while a a uh, student in Seoul Arts High School, and he he turned to saxophone when he decided to focus on jazz. He was a brilliant technique. He has brilliant techniques such as uh, diverse intonation, non-breath, circular breathing, multiphonic, and exquisite toning. And because of this, he is acknowledged among jazz maniacs and uh, critics as one of the best, three best free jazz saxophonists among jazz uh, in the world, together with Evan Parker in England and Nat Rodenberg in the US. The trio's uh, early performance at the Spade Theater were compiled in a single track, Soul Free Music Trio, on the, on the album Korean Fus Free Music Live Improvisation. This album also features British saxophone player Evan Parker and a duo recorded with the Japanese musicians Takata Mizuki. Kang's reputation is a particularly, oh, particularly a significant in Japan, where he founded a free improvisation uh, group, Tongurami, with uh, Midori Takata percussion and Sato Masioki piano in 1982. They produced two albums, Parangot and Ancient Spirit. At the same time, Kang continued to work with Korean traditional musicians, including original Samulori group and the composer and double read flute player, PD player, Wang Yi. The album Dokkebi was released as a result of a collaborations between Kang and the Korean East Coast shaman and shun specialist Kim Seok Chul and his nephew and Jango double headed drum. You, you will see it later um, tonight, I'm going to perform tonight, Kim Yong Tech. It was co-produced co by the Victor Record Company in Japan and the Korean label Sounds Deep Space. Let's have a listen to an excerpt of the Dok Dubi. So this... So you can hear the sound of the shon. This is traditional shon. Um, and then... Um, it, this is a super imposed by Kang's saxophone sound. So it is an articulation of a rapid ornamentation and expressive uh, vibrato. Okay, this is quite short, but anyway. <laughs> the at the, moment, at the time unique approach to music making of Kang and his collaborators strongly influenced a number of young musicians working in both Korean traditional music and jazz circles. One percussionist, Park Tip Chung, is notable among them. And Kang and Park formed the Kang duo in 1996. So Park Tae Chan is, uh, was born in 1961 and graduated from Chungang University in 1986 with a degree in competition. He invented a new drum set that consisted of a mix of Korean and Western percussion set up on the floor in the way as Korean percussion would be no, routinely placed for Samuluri performances. In addition to the Kang Jiu, Bak has de developed a series of projects with the uh, uh, jazz pianist Mian. Dreams from Ancestor is one of the Mian and Jae Chen's albums, which won the Best Album Award for Jazz Crossover and the World um, and the World for the Best Performances. Best performance at the sixth Korean popular music competition in 2009. In the last piece on the album, The Dream Fugati, the Korean tradition rhythmic pattern, Kiguna, <coughs> also known as a chilte, provides a pivotal structure for improvisation. At first, it follows um, uh, it follows a 62 quaver 
bit pattern. Then this is progressively cut down to 48, 36, and 12, 6, 4, 2, and 1 bit pattern. Incre interestingly, this cutting down process is executed in a low logical way, heavily dependent on mathematical calculation, but without regard for uh, rhythm. The geo calls it a structured improvisation, contrasting the rhythmic part, a linear melody drawn from the co Korean pop song, Seya Seya, runs through the entire piece um, in a D area mode. This is a Korean pop song, Seya Seya. Da, 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 da. Yeah. So, um, the celebration of a tradition in this piece is achieved by creating something new, mixing it, mixing with, mixing it with the old project. The duo's innovation creates a new complex rhythmic structure that still can be heard to descend from Korean traditional music. Okay, let's move on to the Korean traditional musicians who attempt to combine jazz and Korean traditional music. Among the few groups who attempt to combine jazz and Korean traditional music with their foundation on the traditional side, Tamarui, Korean Percussion Quartet, first and foremost gained both national and international reputation. Um, of the inspiration this percussion quartet made, the project band SXL, consisting of well-known jazz musicians including Bill Russell and Schenker, uh, played a number of shows in Japan. The collaboration resulted in two recordings, uh, live in Japan and SXL, into the island outlands. Late, later, Roswell turned sound engineer for a further, further experimental album by Samulori alone record of changes. As international interest in its Hamulori grew, the group came to the attention of major recording companies and among them, Polygram published what has become one of the most notable fusion masterpieces, Red Sun's Hamulori, 19, uh, 1989. A joint project of the Hamulori Ensemble with the German, German jazz group Red Sun. This became something of a global hit, selling 70,000 copies, and led to additional interest from the more avant-garde jazz label uh, ECM, run by Manfred Ahimian. <laughs> ECM published the album, um, then comes the White Tiger. Moreover, Reston and Tamiruri have been invited to various uh, kind of a jazz um, festivals and have played with inter interna internationally acclaimed musicians such as Chick Corea, Harvey Hanko, uh, the Miles Davis group, and Steve Gadd. As you may hear, the fusion sounds pretty good, um, but you also uh, notice that through the uh, tendency remains, like the tendency still remain um, in which Samuel um, just remains Korean, the jazz remains a rather contemporary jazz. So, <clears throat> okay, my second example of a traditional musician is Wonin. This is the rest of the time already, and let's move on to Wonin. Wonin is a composer and Korean oboe, PV player, and percussionist based on his rich experiment studying Korean traditional music, shaman music, tamurori, and PV oboe. One has actively composed new music for dance, stage, and screen, 
One received the Golden Bell Award for his film score, Konni Opeto, in 1996, a film about the citizen uprising in Gwangju in 1980 and the, its violent suppression by the military, and has received the same award on three further occasions. He has been a member of various groups focusing on creative Korean tradition music, contemporary development of tradition. Sergi Dong, formed in the 1985, is one of the longest lived and most popular ensembles of this sort. They aim to create new folk songs touching the Korean ethos through the use of through the use of tradition elements. Puri, a creative tradition percussion ensemble founded in the in 1993, and the group Parambot Cape of Wind, an instrumental ensemble specializing in the development of music dramas and composed of Taegum Flute, Piri Ovo, Kayagum, uh, and Kamungu Zibelis are two other groups one has been associated with. He is currently a professor at the Korean National University of Arts. When a visiting scholar in ethnomusicology at US, uh, UCLA for a year, one made his uh, first solo album, Asura. This is the cover of Asura. And, um, um, in the album, he is uh, uh, a number of uh, uh, American jazz musicians uh, participated in the music album, such as avant-garde trumpeter Lyric Smith, pianist Art Hiragara, and bassist Toast Sikakus. The first track, Moonlight Saving, which we have, we're going to hear now. Actually, it takes the Korean folk song Bongu Potaya and modifies it, transforming it into a standard jazz song with obvious harmonic changes in the rhythmic sections. So let's move outside of the Korea to my third segment. Chini Kim is a Kamungu, Korean six string jitter, as you can see on the screen, uh, who is based in the United States, born in Incheon in 1957. Kim was a trained at the National Traditional Music High School and as a composer at Seoul National University. However, unlike other traditional musicians, he, she decided that she, Korean traditional music was um, uh, so unappreciated in Korea itself that he, she felt unable to explore her creative passion for its fully, I must be humble, passion fully in the country and so set off for the United States. There, she started an MFA in electronic music and composition in Mills College. Following her graduation in 1985, Kim has had many reputable commissions. Her first com composition, Ilze, Linking, commissioned by the Cornus Quartet, was performed in 1986, an opportunity which led to a further Further commissioned piece, Noon Rock, first com performed in 1992 at the Lincoln Center by the same ensemble. She also has established a reputation as a contemporary composer regularly commissioned by the, the American Composers Orchestra, by the National Endowment for the Arts, and by the uh, Asia Society in New York. Her composition style is characterized as a shikin uh, living tones. She explains this as follows. The, the conceptual basis for living tones, uh, which is the essential element in Korean tradition music, is that each tone is alive, embodying its own individual shape, sound, texture, vibrato, glissando, expressive nuances, and dynamics. Living tones can take on a dramatic weight that makes music rich. This notion is well de demonstrated on an electric kamungo, which she invented and for which she is uh, well known. The instrument has eight strings rather than six as in the original Co Korean instrument, each of which is attached to electric pickups. The electric inputs are processed by uh, a MXA 
MAST program and modulate through uh, her laptop computer, normally synchronized with moving images projected on the screen. traditional one and um, the electric one at the same time. As a performer, she has worked with prominent jazz musicians such as James Newton, Foote, Bill Frisell, uh, guitar, <laughs> Derek Bailey, guitar, and Eva Parker, piano and saxophone. The wide range of her experimentation of, uh, with the free jazz is, is to date collected on eight albums. She is um, concerned in her improvisation to con consciously adapt the differences of a multicultural environment. One key project was her New World in Improvisation collaboration in 1989 with avant-garde oboe player and then boyfriend Joseph, her boyfriend Joseph Salim. He also moved uh, subsequently toward Japan, Australia, New Zealand, Indonesia, Europe, Argentina, Peru, and Russia. The rec recording around the world contains world music tryouts with the Senegalese Mort. Mortien, the Indian sitar player Rahul Sariputura, and a Japanese goto player. Taking down Jimmy Kim's path has helped inspire my own project. Three years ago, I embarked on a project scheduled in rhythm with jazz drummer Simon Barker, which resulted in a concert held in, in 2011 at the Korean Cultural Center in London. Barker is a pioneering jazz musician who was the first recipient of the PhD in jazz at the University of Sydney. He developed a project band in Taoyuan, which um, Pansovi singer, Korean singing style, Pansovi singer Yip Dong Bae and percussionist Dong Won Kim, which was uh, filmed by Emma France and turned into a documentary movie, Intangible Asset Number no. 82. In, 19, in 2008, winning various prizes, including Best Documentary at 2009 uh, Durban International Film Festival and Official Selection at the Melbourne International Film Festival, this film became something of a hit. According to my memory of uh, when I tried to try to make a recording with him, uh, he did not give me a clear sign where I, I'm supposed to start or stop. Corresponding to the groove in jazz, the pulse is a general description referring to the specific measuring standard of Changdan, the metric patterns of Korean traditional rhythm of Changdan, in which, triple, in which triple divisions occasionally multiple bits are prominent. The breath, also referred as a grouping, is the general description referring to the specific measuring standard of Korean rhythm which can be equivalent to the groove in jazz. I soon found that there was some abstract span in the spinning, which has a similar structure to the one Korean rhythmic structures have. The circle is not the division of a fixed circle, rather it is a constantly changing but contains the emotional hear the drum sound. Anyway, something like that. <laughs> and uh, recently I have some quite interesting projects uh, with some uh, Berlin-based uh, jazz pianist Nils Brown and a uh, London-based um, producer slash hip-hop musician, uh, Ghost Poet, as part of a BBC radio project, uh, Red Junction. So I think it's one of the very interesting examples of my project because uh, I uh, performed with not only jazz musicians, also 
hip hop musicians uh, because I don't really do different kinds of musicians from different musical cultures and uh, and actually in the morning we just met without any discussion we just straight on perform together and recording some like a two hours tracks so which is amazing so I, I think uh, we didn't any use any other kind of a methodology apart from improvisation I think uh, the methodology drawn from the jazz can be used to create some kind of a innovate the heritage I just uh, uh, inherited from, uh, from the, the past. Do you know your song? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's pretty good. Yeah. 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 Okay, conclusion. <laughs> it is an ongoing project for me to collaborate, in, collaborate with jazz musicians and to apply my findings to future ventures. What I have found from the analysis so far is that there are different and layered definitions of both musical genres depending on the perspectives taken by each musician or group. These depend on a conceptualization of different abstract ideologies based on different subject positions and also on the technical medium used to deliver the abstract ideas themselves, such as musical genre. Elements are wrapped with political and sociological messages on the part of the performers as well as the audiences. I have discussed three perspectives that I have, have been taken. First, Korean traditional musicians living in Korea, such as Hamil Lori performers and Won Yi, define their music making as representing Koreanness. This, in turn, contains a number of musical signals representing nationalistic values but jazz is used as a symbol for it or Korean modernity. A parallel case to this might be Nepalese rap, as discussed by Paul Green. However, the, pre repre uh, the presentation of jazz in the context of the creative Korean traditional music mainly relies on a generic types of uh, standard jazz, harmony, rhythm, orchestration, more than the use of jazz standards that functions as a contemporary element in the total composition. And second, however, Korean jazz musicians living in Korea understand jazz in a different way. Taken from the development of Beyond the GI shows that occurred from the late 1970s, 70s onwards, they, they are keen on abstract concept of jazz that occur occurred from the uh, late 1970s, um, oh sorry, they are keen on abstract concepts of jazz defined as individual freedom and expression. The adaptation, um, the adoption of this um, provides a conceptual pl platform for more individually unique, adventurous, and distinctive uh, performances. So when they incorporate elements from Korean roots, they, will, they treat them as another kind of individual languages within the framework of jazz projected for the environment. So the Korean legacy only serves to expand the, their larger, more individual improvisation language. It is not surprising that among the layers of components within new fusion Korean music, jazz musicians are most often keen on exploring discrete musical stylistic components such as scales, motifs, uh, rhythmic structures, and gestures. Finally, for transnational Korean musicians in the dis diasporas living outside of Korea, philosophies rather than musical forms behind, behind the Korean music become the nexus of musical representation. These include, for example, religion and the philosophical underpinnings of separate traditional music styles such as a pop, ritual, shaman, and folk. Jazz, however, is more likely to be used as a methodology rather than a discrete or symbolic content. The stylistic incorporation of Korean philosophical elements within structural methods provided by jazz is used to fuse the two different musical cultures. It is interesting to see that jazz is now served up as a container for holding Korean logic allowing musicians to solidify their positions as representing the diversity of a transnational cultures. Jazz becomes, uh, becomes a medium to convey the idealized and depoliticized 
authenticity of Korea reflected in the diasporic networks. Where I am now, <laughs> I am a traditional musician based in London at the moment. I've collaborated with many musicians, including jazz musicians, but the most difficult thing for me is to channel through the layers of adjust myself to new cultural forms. Recognize that this is difficult within Korea due to my instrument being so closely tied to the first position I have discussed here. I'm trying in my research to find alternative positions in order to move creativity involving Korean traditional music instruments forward. Thank you. So maybe we just can open up if anyone has a question while they were setting up. Uh, so 
explain the, the first one is the, the Feminist Archive South, which I'm a trustee of, and um, we just have a website, it's not so much a platform for dissemination, and the Women's Liberation Music Archive, which um, I'll talk more about because this presentation is about uh, music making the women's movement, um, but that basically um, documents the history of music making from 1970 to 1989, in the, in the UK, and then the sister show we visited was a local history project about feminism in Bristol, where, where I live, uh, from 1973 to 1975. So, so very much using these, these tools that are, are readily available. Um, so, um, why is this? Why is this? Uh, why this is doubly important for heritage, or why I think it's important to look at. Um, feminism, the history of feminism through a heritage lens is because um, I argue that uh, feminism is defined by generational thinking as such. So I'm not sure how many of you um, are familiar with the kind of narrative tropes that are passed around about feminism, but I'll just summarise them for you. Um, there's, the, there's a strong alliance on these narrative tropes of, tropes of the waves, so that there's the first wave, the second wave, the third wave, and now people talk about the fourth wave of feminism. Um, so there's this very... The, the wet, these, these kind of generational based narratives have the effect of containing um, our relationship to uh, feminist history and, and feminist knowledge production. Uh, so they frame what we know already um, about generations, so we don't need to sort of revisit uh, what, what happened at, at a particular time in feminist history. This is an argument made by uh, the, the feminist theorist Claire Hemmings. Um, so, but um, even though there's this reliance on these narrative tropes, I would suggest that generation remains largely unthought within feminism. And I say largely because um, there's an article called Kate Eichhorn, who's, who's written a recent book called The Archival Turn of Feminism, which begins to unpick some of these ideas. Um, but because it remains largely unthought, uh, we need to pay attention to the processes of transmission, of how no knowledge and heritage is transmitted across generations. Um, so uh, I've got a quote there, which is kind of disappearing from the bottom of the, the PowerPoint. Uh, if you need it for um, um, It's okay, I can just say what it is. Um, yeah, so tradition is one name for knowledge. Um, tradition raises the question of the transmission of knowledge. <coughs> and that's a quote from Bernard Stiegler. Um, so, so really what I'm interested in doing um, within, within my work currently in this, this, this project that I'm writing up um, is to look at politics of, her uh, politics of tradition and, and what it means to kind of develop a, a kind of political um, standpoint towards the question of tradition and transmission of knowledge, um, which, which lends itself to the question of heritage, so not so much innovation, but the kind of the political questions that are invested in, in, in um, tra traditional, uh, in, in, anyway, yeah, tradition. So, I should go on. So, the UK Women's Liberation Movement, when is it? Um, it's, a, it's a period that's also often referred to as second wave feminism, but I tend to not refer to it as second wave feminism because um, I don't want to fall back upon these, these trope-like narratives. And I don't, I, I've rarely seen women in the archival work that I've done, I've rarely seen women describe themselves as, sec as second wave feminists at the time. They've only ever described themselves as being involved in the women's liberation movement. So I think it's very important to acknowledge that archival specificity. Um, and obviously an extraordinarily diverse movement. Um, so, but broadly speaking, from the late 1960s to the late 1980s, um, if you want to know more about it, I suggest going to the, the recently launched Sisterhood and Laughter project, which was made in collaboration with the, uh, with the British Library, which is an oral history of the women's movement. Um, has lots of, uh, it's kind of thematically organised and curated very nicely as a way, as an access point in which to understand and learn more about the UK Women's Liberation Movement. Um, so, uh, so my work's been mainly concerned with the, the kind of material and immaterial culture of the women's movement. So, so not so much um, looking at kind of the, I guess the, often sometimes the way in which the second wave of feminism or the women's liberation movement is framed is in terms of a, a search for equality, um, which of course was part of it, but I'm actually more interested in the kind of world-making cultural aspects of, of the women's movement. So, so I've been, my, my work has been oriented towards this, the cultural production, um, which obviously necessitates and invites questions of, of 
heritage um, because you know we encountered them as in archives and um, so so and, and this, this picture actually is, is uh, from an exhibition that I curated and it's a picture it's a poster of the feminist improvising group um, which is mostly ties in with your um, your presentation uh, so yeah. So, women's liberation movement, mu music making, um, was one of the reasons in which that I started to do uh, research about it was because there was just an absolute dearth of material uh, on music making in the women's movement, and um, I, I was involved in music making myself um, as an activist, and I kind of had this, this in inkling that there was a lot of cultural forms. Um, made in the women's movement, there was a lot of musical forms, but that we just didn't have the, the access to them. So um, part of the was that revealed? No, that's taken away. Oh, okay, cool. Um, so yeah, so the music making edge was anti commercial and intangible rather than intangible. And I use these terms even though um, in the keynote yesterday uh, there was a really wonderful problematization of the terms of intangible and, and tangible heritage. Um, but uh, I think it's quite useful, the, the conceptualization of intangible cultural heritage is quite a useful way to think about uh, ephemeral forms of cultural production. And, and that they are, they do, even though they are mobilized and used in a similar way to, to use the Laura Jane Smith's um, description of, of, of heritage and how it's how it's used I think there is there is there is a clear difference between um, tangible forms of monumental heritage and, and ephemeral forms of cultural production um, I think on a material level so I think it's worth uh, and, and I'm going to come on and talk about um, the, the convention for intangible cultural heritage as a tool to, to think about heritage in a minute um, so it's not necessarily tied to a specific place that could be plaqued. So uh, events took place in, uh, you know, squats or temporary accommodation. So it, is, it has this very ephemeral nature. So in, in a way, it's it's very it's very in opposition to how uh, popular music heritage is is often um, heritage heritageized in the sense of you know here's where this great event happened. We'll put a plaque side of it you know it doesn't have any of these kind of things and it doesn't actually have very many records either um, because music was often you know made it was it, it was made in the, the, the period of just before the explosion of DIY culture in the late 70s in Britain so studios were expensive to use and uh, were often quite intimidating environments for women to go in and, and uh, you know play in and record music in so there's actually not many recorded artifacts, you know, finished recorded artifacts. So, like, you know, like an album. You know, you, it's it's quite hard to canonise popular music history um, if there isn't any any albums, any artifacts. So, but what we do have is, is various different, you know, recorded remains of like practices, live performances, so forth. So there are there are processual, if you like, um, remains of these histories, but not the finished product. Um, but certainly not anything that you necessarily sell again so um, so that's just that's a poster from one of the, the events that took place um, so um, yeah this is terrible because um, the this is the problem with open office the Libra open try and use open software this is what happens but um, anyway it's a picture of Rachel House's feminist disco Rachel House is a London based artist and she did this thing called feminist disco which was a, a series of miniature islands, and it was a, an island for the Slits to live on, an island for um, Jane County to live on, and Patty Smith to live on, and um, polystyrene, who are obviously punk figures, but and are not actually part of this genealogy of, of women's liberation music making. But nonetheless, this idea, and using this idea of, of the 
of the islands, which you can't see, so I'm just describing them to you, um, as, um, as a way to think about the transmission of, of, of feminist musical memory and, and, and the kind of, um, yeah, the transmission of, of feminist musical memory in the sense that islands are stranded from each other. Um, so you have this, uh, you know, the, the, the islands are stranded from each other and from mainstream society. So you have this, there's always this reinsertion of, of women within um, musical heritage narratives or any kind of history narrative. You know, women's, women's history is never simply present in the way that men's histories are, it seems, or it, that's, there's certainly that kind of orientation within feminist um, historical practices. And you can say this for, you know, lots of different kinds of marginal histories as well. Um, so it's quite, a, it's a quite nice motif for thinking, for, for sort of spatialising and visualising uh, the movement and the, the, the difficulties in transmission because of, you know, they're just simply not connected to each other, these, these islands. Anyway, you can't see them, so. Um, I don't even have the point of this PowerPoint is. Because it's <laughs> anyway, so, so the UNESCO um, Intangible Cultural Heritage um, Convention, I often use it more as a, as a, as a base for theorising rather than actually thinking about um, using it to recognise uh, you know, these, these forms of cultural heritage because it would be you know, quite strange in a way to, to, to sort of demand for UNESCO um, with recognition for these very um, oppositional forms of cultural history, grassroots cultural history. But um, what I'm interested in is, is how you can see the, these, 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 the knowledge and skills, um, objects, artifacts, cultural, um, cultural spaces associated with communities and groups and, and, and cultural heritage which is transmitted from generation to generation um, and, and how these forms of culture provide uh, groups with um, identity and continuity. Um, I'm interested in this, this question of transmission so um, and, and the, the, the specific kinds of knowledge and skills and practices that were generated within music making within the women's movement. So um, yeah, I, I, intangible cultural heritage slightly against the grain of, of how it's usually um, theorised. So obviously is often associated with uh, non non industrial societies and um, you know traditional culture um, and not used as as far as I know to um, to protect the cultural heritage of radical political traditions. Um, but I think it's quite significant that there is this. Um, Acknowledgement in the in the convention to the threat posed by globalization um, and, and how that um, you know has a threat to the deterioration and disappearance and de destruction of cultural and economic diversity. Um, so I've, ad I've added those two things. So um, it's I think it's it's relevant for as a tool for thinking about how. You know, other forms of, of culture, other forms of economic and cultural organisation outside of the dominant ones um, are threatened and um, you know, necessarily need to be protected. And so it's, it's quite a, I quite enjoy thinking with, with it as a, as a tool, but I say not necessarily something in practice, but more something to think about how this can be applied uh, to a context where you perhaps wouldn't expect it to be applied. So. Anyway, on to intangible cultural heritage in the women's movement. Uh, again, you can't really you can't really see <laughs> see this, but this is the Women's Liberation um, Rock Band, Northern Women's Liberation Rock Band Manifesto, which uh, was an artifact that was uh, disseminated more wild, widely than the music of the Northern Women's Liberation Rock Band. So they were one of the first uh, rock bands in the women's movement, and um, so you know there was the London Women's Liberation Rock Band and the, the Northern. Liberation rock band. So, and they actually talk about uh, this. This song is called Matriarchy, and what you can't see on this PowerPoint is um, is, is this this notion of. Um, they talk about how we 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 left very few traces, and you know they were they were. They talk about the the cultural heritage of matriarchy in this very intangible way, like that. You know, you have to listen very carefully to um, to be able to hear it. So, 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 so drawing on this, this thing about the practices, um, knowledge, skills and techniques, uh, you can see here a picture of a music making workshop which, was, that took place
place in the women's liberation movement. And I'm going to play you some clips from the film as well, but I think maybe the, the sound might be a bit of a problem. But Oh, actually, I'll just play a thing that, a clip from a piece of music. Oh, sorry, a, a piece of music. A little rate, an excerpt, so you might be able to hear the quick little work and hear.
recordings of the music, but there's also, you know, this kind of more ephemeral uh, um, uh, documentation of, of lyrics and, you know, guitar chords. That it would be very difficult to actually, you know, know how to how the melody went just by strumming a guitar. So, so. Um, I say the mus musical scores um, acting as instructions, but um, demonstrating that music is there to be reinterpreted, reinterpreted, reinterpreted and activated rather than simply consumed. So I think that's also part of it, part of the reason why they were so keen to, to write the music down um, in, in the way of, of, of scores, and um, was, was because they, they wanted you know people to play it. It was uh, it wasn't there to be consumed in that way. Um, you see that nice like women musical score there um, and also um, guitar chords this there was there was that you know simultaneous to this reappropriation of technique there was also the breaking down of technique um, so I mean that's that's the one thing about music making in the women's movement it wasn't just one thing it wasn't just very rarely was it like rock music or, or guitar based music it was you know free improvisation um, like making up new genres, um, you know, taking existing forms, uh, jazz and, and blues and so forth. So it was, it was a very multiple thing, but it was, it was, you know, used to express this, this women's culture and empower women to, to find their voice as that excerpt, you know, it's very, very bluntly demonstrated, but I, I quite like it, I quite like, I do, I feel very attached to these archives of the in their kind of brutal earnestness. It's, it's very refreshing. So, and that's another example of, uh, you can't really see it, but it's, uh, you know, deconstructing. It's the thing that you'd expect to find in a punk scene of the late 70s. Uh, and I'll just finish with a quote from Eamon and Jameson, who wrote the book Music and Social Movements. Um, he talked about the mobilization of tradition. Um, so, so how, you know, music remains as, as a potential way to inspire new waves of mobilisation. So, so really, I, I, mean my, I guess my core, my core point in, in the context of this, uh, this, this conference would be to think about how, how do the traditions of social movement and other, other kind of political traditions, other ways of living, how are they kept alive, how are they transmitted within a wider social and economic context, which is actually very hostile to, um, you know, kind of actively attempting to, to contain alternative forms of social, economic and cultural relations other than, you know, sort of capitalist ones. So, yeah. Sorry, that was, I was put off by my PowerPoint, so I hope that was clear, but, and, and how good your presentation was, but, um, yeah. And I thought, how could I follow the flute? But that's, that's it. Um, so, yeah, anyway, if anyone wants to ask a question or, like, yeah, feel free. communities of practice, communities of interest, because obviously within heritage discourses there's a lot of em emphasis on, on nationalism and I think it would be actually impossible to do this because the way in which the UNESCO processes work is they even indigenous cultural heritages um, end up having to be in, become subsumed into the nationalist frameworks because like the host nation so to speak has to apply for um, protection, you know, has, they have to become they have to apply through this very nationalist, um, yeah, framework. So, really, what I'm attempting to say in, in, the, in the work I'm doing, the book I'm doing, is is that um, you know communities of interest, um, you know, span 
uh, national and transcend national boundaries, and um, and it's you know perhaps you know an interesting way to think about heritage as, as something you know grouped around something more self-identified and self-chosen, and maybe more around certain types of values rather than becoming subsumed into a, a nationalist framework. So uh, yeah. It's, and, and, and also the, the fact that you know, feminist political traditions, um, they do, they, it has reached a certain stage where there is enough of a tradition, enough of a diverse archive, and enough of a tradition of people picking up these, um, the, the idea of feminism, but also crucially modifying it in relation to um, their own, um, you know, this, this idea of like recreated by communities and, and groups in response to their environments and their interaction with nature and history. And I think, you know, just taking those words, nature and, and history, uh, you know, within, within a feminist context, it's really fascinating because, you know, the feminist context is about re reconfiguring nature, you know, what has been defined as nature, where women have been uh, placed in a very particular role. Um, and I'm interested in this, this, this question of, of the mobility of intangible cultural heritage as well, and how it's defined in, in the act of transmission is something, and you, you know, you demonstrated that throughout your, um, throughout your presentation of, of how, you know, how, how things change, how the signal changes as something is, is modified and, and you know, that, that it, as it changes throughout space and through time and through infections with discourses that are, you know, through, through discourses which are not necessarily um, anticipated, like the, the, you know, the US radio, how that had this very, um, you know, active force in shaping the practice of you know, Korean music and musicians. So it's, um, yeah, I think that's really fascinating and, and just how, you know, say, say for in relation to the women's movement, you know, you had women in the w WSPU, like, um, giving, giving each, um, members like little hammers after they've smashed windows or you have the discourse of sisterhood in the women's liberation movement or you have like riot girl in the 90s and like how this, the feminist signal and the practices and the techniques of feminism change over time but nonetheless remain attached to the broader uh, kind of political idea of women's emancipation and you know and of course you know there's other kind of political traditions like you know almost like very right wing traditions as well um, you know, a hundred years ago, you know, this year you saw the members of the WSPU were aligning themselves with almost fascistic causes because they wanted to, uh, or fascistic politics because they thought that that was the best way that women would get the vote in the UK. So, anyway, it's um, yeah. So I think it's and so this is the kind of way we can develop develop a politics of tradition, which isn't necessarily about looking to a so-called past, which I don't as ascribe to this notion of the past, which is about pastness but like looking at how tradition which you demonstrated is this very kind of active um, transmitted process in in the now which is kind of you know exploring you know as you say all these different kind of um, temporal forms in the musical anyway we go on for hours but yeah so I hope that's that's clear <laughs> um and do you feel like this these you're always talking about this transmission into from the past into the present mm. do you think that this off the grain movement of uh, the 1970s that was bringing this move around. Do you think that it's, it's like been transmitted effectively today, or that there's still very little awareness, or that it, we still sort of follow this dialogue of having sort of sexist music versus this underground, mm -hmm. off the grain music? That I mean, for me, I feel like in, in mainstream music, it's still very not mm -hmm. off the grain, as you said. Yeah, yeah, totally. I mean, I mean. Uh, until that we collected this collection of, of music making practices from the women's movement, it was basically, it wasn't, it was there, you know, I was talking to you about the already there um, before, um, but it wasn't, all, I mean, the key thing about the transmission of cultural memory, it has to be organized and concentrated and it has to be put in circuits for it to, to, to become operationalized. So, um, you know, no, I mean, is the answer basically until, until we, you know, until we created it, it was all there. It just needed to be organized and ordered, you know, A to Z, these are the acts, um, and this is what they did. And, and, and also once you have that organization, you can then interpret and disseminate them. Um, but yeah, certainly within the field of, of feminist cultural memory and musical memory, I'd say that, you know, Riot Girl as a, as a sonic imaginary and as an aesthetic has only determined um, the kind of, yeah, the, the sonic imaginaries of, of, of feminist music making. 
um, which is interesting in itself because you know that's a predominant a sort of you know a specific kind of music making practices a, a punk practice oriented towards certain kinds of, of sounds and you know instruments and yeah. so so yeah and, and yeah there's still massive inequality in in music today definitely so, yeah. and stereotyped roles if raw women are in, involved in it you don't see half as many women musicians as you do men. So I mean, it's great to have to see you playing the flute. So. Yeah, I think that's like a really, that's a really, that point is a really good lead way into making this discussion open now. I mean, the whole point of this seminar is that we can now sort of open it up to everyone to contribute any thoughts that they have regarding these two topics. It's not really a lecture anymore. So um, maybe I can just <laughs> offer a few questions that people can answer however we want to. Um, just from what she just said and combining then what Hiram was talking about, how can we uh, combine musical tradition in a contemporary context with various themes? And um, do you think that it's good or it's bad to do something like that? Because perhaps some people would argue that the bringing traditional music into a contemporary context somehow damages its authenticity, whereas on the other side, maybe not bringing it into a contemporary context loses loses it completely. So, does anyone have anything to offer? Hmm. I think there's um, an interesting something interesting around the idea of tradition, which probably is getting on the point you were saying earlier. But but uh, it doesn't authenticity only exist in that it didn't exist, and I think the search for the authentic. Not just immediately uh, 
abolishing all traditional music and just staying underground with new wave sounds, but some sort of compromise of the, the traditional music, but we add a contemporary twist on it. I yeah. Think. Um, it's a quite difficult question because um, um, I only been around in London only for eight years. Mm -hmm. So I think when I do some kind of one-off concert, it's a more, uh, more like um, I can draw more audience than I guess for myself as like a fusion traditional contemporary things because uh, it's a more um, kind of it, I I can target more wider range yeah. of the audiences. But um, if I I think I think that for the long term, I better to stabilize with some kind of a, a specific group of a people who appreciate the music. Then I might need to stabilize some kind of a stylistic idea on the, the music I'm trying to do in my tradition. Then I might better just uh, be more specific than just a broad or fusing a different kind of stuff and combining the different. Long term, I think, are better to stick to one specific idea of a tradition than develop a more established or stylistic idea. Yeah. Have you ever had a, any negative reaction that you've taken traditional sounds and fused it with Western jazz music? Or yeah, of course, there must be some negative ideas. They are not openly <laughs> saying that this is so bad or something like that. They generally think it sounds very new to them, mm -hmm. so they try to like open to the kind of different. But I can see there is still kind of uh, limitations because there are like a fundamental just, uh, system that each of the music has is totally different, like a totally foreign tuning system. Even I think it, it, all the stylistic elements contains some kind of more cultural broader uh, meaning behind it. So I think uh, so if you just put them together, always cause some kind of a problem. So you need always maybe negotiating or need some kind of totally new approaches to deal with those kind of different um, kind of, uh, I don't know, new experiments on this yeah. stuff. Yeah. But I think, um, yeah, but I, I'm just trying to embrace it and try to develop some kind of a solution to sort them out. Yeah. And I think it is an inevitable process. Uh, we, we are exposed to so many cultures with the uh, globalization and there is no other way. I mean, the people are supposed to uh, so many new things, and uh, they want just to experience new, new, uh, new uh, everything. I mean, uh, regarding art, culture, uh, music. Uh, so um, I think it is not a process which can be stopped. It is mm -hmm. very natural. I think, mm -hmm. like it or not. Yeah. I just want to ask people about what they think. Uh, outside of like some nationalist traditions. I'm just wondering if anyone's come across any literature or perspectives that have, have moved close to, to the way I'm thinking about it in any way. I just sort of, I can't seem to find any. Um, so I appreciate you. No? Well, I haven't. I, found, I mean, I found that project really fascinating and the, the, the ephemeral nature of mm. um, the archive and the, and the feminist movement that you're looking at in, in its particular context was really interesting. But it, it begs the question for me about improvisation, which, which was kind of a link, and I'm wondering about the role of improvisation within the music as opposed to within the kind of practices around the sort of um, music practices we're looking at. So specifically within the music, can you say something about the improvisation or whether there is some or isn't some? Because that implies a kind of openness yeah. in, in the sense of the, you know, the traditional Korean music with, with, with an openness to kind of jazz 
Oh, yeah. Improvised. Yeah. yeah. So I just wondered if you could comment on that in some way. Well, yeah, there's a, a feminist improvising group, and I don't know if you, any of you know Maggie Nichols, but um, the feminist improvising group was one of the first, like, women's um, feminist improvising groups, and it had people like Georgina Ball and Sally Potter, the feminist filmmaker, and Lindsay Cooper, who died last year, and various other folks from the um, women's movement. So there was, as I say, there was like, they drew on so many different styles, and like absolutely um, this kind of idea of improvisation as, as, a, as a social practice within the women's movement was definitely taken up by um, certainly Maggie's work, and she went on to do this collective called Contradictions, um, so which was all about people being in their contradictory rhythms together. So, um, yeah, and, and about enabling other people to try different things. Because one of the other things that was important in the women's movement was that you know, music making practices were broken down and made accessible, which was the point of the, the workshop um, photo that I showed you. Um, so, so, you know, there were spaces of improvisation. Um, and indeed, the whole kind of you know, project was a project in improvisation in an abstract sense because people were just, you know, making it up as they went along within certain structures, within sort of, you know, structural comings together. But I think it, it's, it really is sort of, you know, an improvised um, larger action, you know, kind of certainly not following an established script, but trying to create the world in a different rhythm, a different organisation, different structural relationships, which, you know, improvisation allows to a degree with its emphasis on the coming together and, and listening and mm -hmm. to each other in different elements. So, yeah, I was wondering, could you talk as well about more about improvisation and your experience perhaps of doing the, you know, the final um, example that you used with the ghost poet and the, the other person, um, like how, yeah, how, how, how was that for you? And, uh, um, I think it was possible because we all have a kind of very like a solidified idea of our like a grounding. So we, I'm from the Korean tradition and, and he's from jazz and the other one is from hip hop. So that's why this kind of improvisation, the concept of improvisation was actually working quite well. So improvisation is not all about freedom or free things. Actually, unless you don't have any ground to root it on, mm. it's uh, impossible to do it, I think. So I think it was really good to have some kind of a solid idea of your identity, then the impossible possible can be happen. So that's why I was wondering actually, I think when it comes to defining the characters, I think it's all about the definition. So have you thought about the kind of stylistic ideas, so what is the music for a feminist movement? The genre. Genre, or you, know, you said you sometimes adopt Borrows and blues, jazz, improvisation. Yeah, it just was loads of different things. Like mm -hmm. it was all, it was like you know, women's music was like you know, no one knew, no one knew exactly what it was, but it was, it was lots of different forms and different, say, in, um, appropriated forms, but also, you know, trying to create these new, these new forms and which are also drawing on you know other traditions. So it was a multiplicity. It wasn't a genre. It was a practice. It was those kind of things. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, it's, I think it's, it's, in a way, that's what's made it hard to, hard to grasp for people over, mm -hmm. over time, is because you can't necessarily pin it down to one thing. It demands you to engage in it in its complexity, which is, is, um, which is that music has a social and cultural practice, which can't be necessarily sold as such, but has to be conformed and moved into. It's that absolutely intricate with the, you know, with the culture, and it was, you know, there was so, so, so fixated on not being commercial. Um, and they had such a very nuanced um, critique of the, of the culture industry and popular music and what it did to relationships and what it did to, um, you know, what, what, what it did to women, representations of women, like the image of women. Um, so it was, it was all part of, you know, part of that. So I, I find it absolutely fascinating for that reason as, you know, as a body of, of cultural production um, which, which absolutely necessitates engaging with it in a, as a form of heritage rather than something that can be, you know, necessarily reduced to, um, you know, one, well, I don't know, heritage can be reduced to one thing, but anyway, it's, it's however, move on, I'm just like babbling, it doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah, because um, I think that, 
from my experience, and I did a lot of just sort of follows and kind of studies studies and things on the art of different genres. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a tool. I can't think that. I think it's a quite difficult to eliminate the kind of um, um, the kind of uh, the cultural meaning that mm -hmm. uh, the music originally contained. So, for example, from rap or jazz, if you are just a music that's not the dose of jazz, it always is like the input of the the, the jazz originally has transmitted to, to the collaboration I just was doing with jazz musicians. So I'm just because, um, uh, for example, when you're just uh, drawing on from kind of a English pop music, mm -hmm. have you just uh, ever think about some kind of nationalistic ideas, which mm -hmm. is kind of contradicted to the feminist movement? So have you have you ever experienced that kind of a con conflict? Um, what, sorry, what's the? What do you? Sorry, can you? <laughs> what do you mean the, the in relation to like the day the traditional music or mm -hmm. the folk like the nationalistic folk music like yeah. even like Irish or some sort of this like very traditional uh, in the Highlands maybe kind of music does that mm -hmm. conflict with the no I think this actually I think it's it's congruent actually the kind of um, the English folk tradition and like certainly um, performers like Frankie Armstrong who's amazing do you know her. Um, mm -hmm. Like she's an amazing, she's just the best. So Frankie Armstrong is amazing. <laughs> she's a traditional, um, f uh, traditional singer of songs, and she made this album called The Female Pro Prolic in the late sixties, which is one of the um, first albums of women's songs. Um, so it drew on those traditions of, of the folk revival, um, and I think, you know, considering in the UK context it hasn't ratified um, the intangible, the Convention for Intangible Cultural Heritage, because. You know, apparently intangible cultural heritage doesn't exist in the UK, but you know, it does. Um, but um, yeah, I think I think it's I think it's comparable. I think the way in which um, like people in the folk revival were talking about music and um, folk culture is, is is probably the closest ally in terms of understanding, and certainly in terms of my approach and orientation to it, and how certainly how I've, I've approached the arc, its archives and its remains are very very. Comparable to to that traditional song mm -hmm. again like mm -hmm. so I think it's I think it's a closer a closer ally and then you know and then I will look the English identity thing I mean that was that was the product of a you know specific kind of mobilization of um, of, of the folk revival done by um, whatever his name is the bloke who started it um, but yeah it's kind of it's how you put spin on it it's not necessarily the it didn't necessarily um, express anything essentially English. I think it's just the, yeah, it's just the way in which certain people adopt cultural forms and, and you know manipulate them essentially or use them to express certain ideas. So, yeah, I think it's very, I think it's a, well, a worthwhile comparison to make anyway. Mm -hmm. yeah. This is also going along with what we discussed earlier about having this fusion between this kind of traditional music, not mm -hmm. so much like ancient, but traditional music that's mm -hmm. now. And I also wanted to draw again on this concept that you talked about and no class. I really, oh, yeah. I really like that statement because I think in, in um, with the uh, introduction of UNESCO World Heritage Sites and now with the Intangible Heritage Convention, there's there's some sort of necessity to have things defined and people have argued against the Intangible Heritage Convention because mm. it is so hard to define what is good uh, universally recognized art or music or, mm. or language and just because something should be protected and, and uh, preserved doesn't mean that another tradition which maybe isn't as well known such as this oppositional music of Roman liberation mm. shouldn't be protected itself so I think that it's, it's nice to bring up this discourse that this amazing tradition existed which is not even really well known in comparison to what has been plaqued technically on the, on the heritage book so I don't think it's universal either no I think well, it's like the, you know, I think it's, I don't think it's necessarily, I think it's potentially universal, but it's, you know, it's, it's self-selecting self in a way. I mean, it's not going to, like feminist cultural heritage isn't going to resonate with everyone, but it's going to really resonate with some people who have those values and who want to have those kind of, you know, those, those ideas in their lives. It's not necessarily of universal significance, even though it would probably, you know, help the world, certain elements of feminist politics, I mean, no, and not, you know, not all of the music of the women's liberation movement is uh, of that quality, arguably, so.
so it's just like, <laughs> yeah. Um, so that's what, yeah. But it is not very uh, maybe her related to this question. I wanted to ask you if um, uh, if there are some external elements um, or natural elements which have some impact on the development of music in a special um, area country. Um, as you were playing the flute, I I had the impression that uh, it sounded like um, uh, like. Um, Sense what it's called the sounds of the birds. Mm -hmm. I mean, as you were playing the, I mean, the tones and the melody was like, like the bird. Uh, you, you're hearing the birds. Mm -hmm. uh, is it is it possible that, uh, that the music has been influenced by by natural elements? Natural elements. Mm -hmm. Like natural, yeah. natural, 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 natural nature. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, of course. I think in the nature, the, in, uh, the basis of the instrument is very close because um, the, the tuning system is based on that bamboo. So I think the, all the tuning systems uh, uh, comes from that, so the length of the bamboo. So which means, um, even though the tuning system is quite different from Western um, equal temperaments, it's the reason why uh, we use that kind of a, a bamboo, the tree, as a kind of base of the measurement of everything, even not only to the music, but also other like a length or a weight, even other like social measurement. So I think uh, we kind of uh, show respect to the nature and uh, that might uh, kind of uh, relevant to the, the sound as well. Mm -hmm. So I think it reflects the kind of a basis of uh, philosophies or the develop the people kind of uh, intention uh, to project through the sound of man. Yeah. Well, I think basically, um, in a concluding statement, we can basically really understand that even though we have two very diverse topics today, it was really interesting to really understand that this sort of off-the-grain conception of music and, and uh, oppositional uh, using traditional methods while transmitting this into contemporary uh, themes is really prominent and especially even having a performer now, this, this combination of, of fusion and tradition is really beautiful and I think that that is really taking us into the next years, we'll see a lot more of this, this theme I think which is just mm -hmm. fantastic. So in general, thank you. Very